Welcome to Food, Wine, and Whiskey, a podcast about having fun conversations on tasty dishes, vinos, and spirits from around the world. Rob is your host. He is an avid home chef, WSET Level 2 award in wine, and a whiskey drinker and collector. Time to set the table. Here's Rob. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Food, Wine, and Whiskey. Thank you for stopping in. We've got a great conversation today. This is, a, if, if you follow the wine world at all, this is a, a pretty hot topic right now that folks are talking about. Uh, and I think it's, it's um, I would call it a concern. We're going to get into that in just a few minutes. Mm-hmm. But I have a, a very special guest on today. He is a di- diploma WSET uh, graduate working towards the Master of Wine. Walder Pimantle is my guest today. How are you doing, Walden? I'm I'm great. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, this is this is a uh, a topic you and I you and I were talking about what mm-hmm. topics we could do a couple shows on and and you sent me over a, a list of things that could be fun to talk about and this one uh, was the first one that jumped out to me. I thought this would be a really good topic in kind of the wine world right now. This is a, a hot thing that people are talking about. Mm-hmm. And again, I said concerned. Is that a fair description? No, yeah, like it's it's a fun thing to talk about. It's also. Is is it so fun? Because I think normally when you the, if the topic is young people drinking wine, you usually are hearing it with kind of a the sky is falling tone. Like yeah. the, the the topic is really are young people drinking wine, and it's it is a topic of concern. Like people, the trends are not clear, and a lot of folks in the wine industry are are wondering like really what's the future if if young people don't drink wine, where do we go next? Yeah, and, and here, here's a thought mm-hmm. that, you know, as we get, well, first, let me start with this. Tell everybody, you know, I mentioned your diploma, WSET, mm-hmm. tell everybody a little bit about you. You know, I always say, you know, share with us your wine journey, how you got into wine, because you're a younger of course. guy. People who aren't seeing this on YouTube uh, mm-hmm. may not see that you're you're a very young guy. I'm not going to ask you your age, <laughs> but you're, you're a young guy, and you've already got the, uh, the diploma from mm-hmm. the WSET, and you... Taking the test for the master? So it's a series of tests. You take the year one, year two, and then if you make it through that, you do a research project. I just sat year one in on June third, so about a month ago, not quite. Um, And we'll see. I yeah, it's at that level. you, You you never know. Like you leave and you maybe feel good, maybe feel bad, but it's a black box until you you get your feedback. Um. So yeah, I'm th- I've sat year one. We'll see if I pass on to year two, but uh, that's so okay. My my wine journey, um, because I did start young, and so yeah, my my wine journey, um, I did start young. It started as a food journey. Um, I for as long as I could remember, I wanted to be a cook. I wanted to be a chef. Um, I was lucky because I got to try that out. I think I mean I think I was thirteen when I first started just asking restaurants, "Hey, can I can I come?" Stage. Can I do whatever whatever job you'll give me? And there were places, nice places that would let me, you know, shock oysters or I think like peeling asparagus was one of the first things. I'd come in, I'd peel three crates of asparagus and take me a couple hours and then I'd leave. And that's yeah. like, you know, you're, you're young, but they know you can't break anything. They'll pay you minimum wage to peel asparagus. Sure. Um, I I'd always tell my friends that and they're like, you peel asparagus. Like, I didn't think they had to be peeled and they don't, but whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. So I did that and I, I loved aspects of it quickly realized like, this is not going to be my career. I, the, the hours are long. It's very hard work. It's, I mean, the, the, the folks running back of house in a restaurant, I think, have some of the, do some of the hardest, most unappreciated work in the food and wine business. Um, yeah, I would agree. And yeah, I, I had, I have so much respect for it, but I, I knew it, it I knew it wasn't going to be for me long term. So I moved to Houston, um, went to school, started taking wine courses, exams. I took, you know, intro sommelier exam, my W set two, my W set three, j- thinking this could be a career. And then really right out of college, started working for the company I work for now. Um, Vino Vera were a local importer distributor. We we source wines from all the, all over the world, ship them straight into the port of Houston, um, and distribute them across the state. And we're we're in the office now. It's it it's always been really exciting to be here because we are my my boss's favorite line. We're we're um, big enough to be relevant, small enough to be elegant. We it's I love that line. At the end of the day, we're depending on you know depending on. The year we're 10, 12 people that just love wine and are super excited and passionate about sourcing it and selling it. Um, 
so my wine journey was kind of, you know, coming through the food industry in between. I, I, I would wait, work these kind of temporary restaurant jobs while I was still in college. Um, and it helped me find my way into like wine full time um, and know that like I, you can still love food. You can still love service and hospitality. And there's always going to be a place for that passion in the wine world. Um, and yeah, I mean, in the past five years, I've, I've worked with Vino Vero. I've worked with the Texas Wine School. Um, teaching and running courses. I've worked in kind of private retail sales, done a number of things. And it's, I love it because no matter what job you have at the end of the day, you're, you're talking to people that just want to geek out on wine and want, oh, want to share, want to share like a unique experience with you. Yeah. Um, so when, when you mm -hmm. were in the, the food world and, and you, mm -hmm. you fa how did you find wine? How did you go from doing these little jobs in the back of the house that, that grow to where they said, hey, you're going to put you out in front of the house? And then you discovered, wait a second, people are, mm -hmm. we've got a wine list, people yep. are drinking wine. And what's this all about? Were you already drinking wine at that point? Oh, it's, it's funny. It came, it was my, I, I got lucky. I lucked out. So I, I had had some kind of experiences with wine. The first place I ever worked, they, it, they, Gave, pitched me on kind of like a week-long internship where I'd spent a day with each major role in the restaurant. And I did get a day with the sommelier, and they no one told him I was 13. <laughs> so <laughs> so he saw, like, I was a kid, kid, and he was just like, oh, well. And there was already wine poured for us, and he was like, I guess you can smell them? Like, I'm not going to let you drink them. Yeah. Like, um, and it, wine is esoteric. It is, I think, of all the alcohols out there, like, one, this is why it's, hard sometimes to bring in young people it's the one that like I have, I have so many friends that are like yeah i love wine but i you know I, I don't order it i don't know enough about it to order it like it's hard to break into so for me the moment was um when i still thought i wanted to be a, a chef i um i have a godfather who's a big foodie who i think really encouraged me to to get further into food and learn everything i could about it and he brought me to alinea in chicago which is incredible you know chef's table world-class restaurant and i was still like 16 at the time but we we came in he was like no we'll do the wine pairings and they didn't question anything um maybe i shouldn't say that maybe i shouldn't get in trouble <laughs> hey, yeah he, that's a few years ago so yeah, yeah that's yeah hopefully i hope there's been enough turnover but i mean yeah. but on the other hand they they really that they gave me my aha moment they um the first couple pairings were great but then there was this one wine that they brought it out and they're like it's gonna be a little stinky smelly like bear with us smell it if you don't like the smell just wait until the pairing hits the table and the pairing for that that wine the wine was leanne borel for um a wine that is still untamed unapo unapologetically funky um and so unique and interesting for that um the the pairing with it was like a braised beef cheek um in lapsong sutrang broth so like a smoked tea broth with chanterelle mushrooms some rosemary some blackberries Ooh. It, it was a funk bomb, like, yeah. on both ends, and the pairing just – it all of a sudden, I was a believer. And I, it was like that was the first moment I can remember tasting something and being like, oh, I taste the barnyard, the smoke, the rosemary, the gurig, whatever you call it. And um, definitely made an impression because you remember the meal. I rem Yeah, and I remember other pairings specific, too, but yeah. that that was the one. And it's the one um, – I still – I love Lambrol. They're, it's a very natural, natural wine. Like, it's, it is a wine where half the – you buy a case, half the bottles will knock your socks off half of them will be strange. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I still buy it every year because yeah. it's it takes me back to that moment. It's fantastic, yeah. yeah. And, and see, I, I'm learning mm -hmm. something because I didn't know that, you know, into wine since you were 13, and I'm not about yeah. not drinking it, but exposed to it and started mm -hmm. to kind of find out about it. So that, that's very cool. Yeah, it's so been, a, you know, a number of years for you. No, I was super lucky because, I, I mean, I didn't really, I still didn't know anything about the industry or any really anything about wine, just kind of had this vague sense that I liked it and might want to do it. And then wine will definitely rewards the the studious and the kind of those with a geeky academic inclination. So I studied it on the side at school. I had books and I, you know, I, I still think I, pr I sat the intro psalm exam and left feeling amazing. Like I knew yeah. every question, which is funny because I didn't know anything. Like <laughs> I knew nothing, but it, it had me interested enough to graduate and say, Hey, let's give this a shot. And I, I still remember at the time I, my two paths in front of me were a, working this job in distribution and import and sales. And then I had been talking with HEB about working with them on their oh. kind of manager fast track. And I've heard nothing but amazing things about HEB. So it was this big like choice. And then I just happened to sign the lease at the wrong time. And I was locked <laughs> into Houston. They wanted me to move to San Antonio. So I was like, okay, I'm doing it. And 
every year since it's been this kind of adventure of like, let's see how long I can make, I can stay afloat. And it's been a lot better than just staying afloat. I've really, really loved, loved my time working in wine. Yeah. That's awesome. And and it's going to continue. This is uh, obviously your Mm -hmm. career now. Yeah. 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 Um, Okay. Topic today. uh, Those who have seen the Mm -hmm. title, it's, uh, you know, selling to young consumers, Mm -hmm. specifically we're talking about millennials and, and Gen Z's Mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, well, first let's, let's talk about, we're, we're going to kind of stay in the U.S. market. Mm-hmm. What, what is the, the U.S. market right now? How, how is the outlook for, it, you know, right in front of us? And then this, you know, kind of two to four year kind of report that you guys might be getting in the industry. What's right in front of us and then two. Okay. Um, it's, 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 I think right now you almost, you almost need a longer than two to four year report. Because okay. The, the, the hard thing, and I, that's what I said earlier, like every time you talk about young, con- young wine consumers, there's this tone of the sky is falling. Because when you think about the, it's 2024 now, the past four years in wine were COVID. Which was huge a boom. Bus, well, huge bust and boom. On-premise bust. Restaurants yeah. struggle just to keep their doors open and their lights on. Um, and then retail boom. DTC started to grow? Yeah, DTC grew a lot. Um and a lot of like a lot of creative other paths to the consumer. Like, you know, like I was working at a wine school at the time, like the whole edutainment, like log on, log into Zoom and take a wine class. That was a thing that I think before people never really were interested in. And we kind of found a way and that has stuck around. There's still yeah. a lot of uh, seminars and classes and, and fun, just fun hangout drinking mm-hmm. events that um, happen that can now happen online that didn't used to happen that way. Yeah. Um, but there was there was a boom and a bust kind of all at the same time. And then following that, I think more of a unilateral bust. Um, you had a couple years of really high production uh, across the globe. Well, and I think the, the, the leading theory now is basically destocking. Um, people drank more during COVID. We and and um, supply chains were really, really um, Stressed? Stra- yeah, stress. There were, yeah, yeah. So, like it was. It took a lot. It took longer to get wine. It was harder to get wine. So distributors stocked up, retailers stocked up, and consumers stocked up. And of course, after that, eventually you're going to have kind of a hangover afterwards, where drinkers are their their cellars are full. Distribute our warehouse still full. And I mean, we we're doing great. We're having a great year. But you have this. Yeah. Then you have the the pendulum swing back, destocking and. I, I personally think the next three years are going to tell us way more about the wine industry than the last four because we had this huge world-changing event in COVID. And um, I, I there are a lot of theories, but I don't think anyone really knows exactly yeah. where the trends are going right now because when I think about my last four years, like when I think about the life I lived in 2020 and even 2021, it's just so different from sure. the last two years and what what has felt like a, a more proper return to normal. Yeah. Um, the zoomed, the further zoomed in version, I think somehow even it's, it's even more panicked because we're still in this mode of destocking. And meanwhile, California had what, like I think Lodi had 400,000 tons of grapes unpicked this last year. Cause they knew like too much oversupply. Yeah. Um, Europe has been more mixed, but in general, I think the next, this, current vintage is looking to be like lower yielding, but we've, we've had a couple vintages of too much wine, not enough drinkers. And, and here's my mm-hmm. question on that too. Cause I've seen some, some reports say that, uh, are, are those grapes, those, those mm-hmm. out in Lodi, are, are they lower quality that they're not making? Cause I've seen some reports that the consumer might not be drinking as far as volume as much wine, yeah. but they but are the, upping the, the price point and getting to, they, they yeah. appreciate quality. And I think that's just, in society now, everything from food to everything, we want a better product that we're we're consuming. And that's the good news. Yeah, no, it is. It's it is lower quality grapes that are being left on the vine. I mean, in general, any segment you look at, you are we're all any age group. We're premiumizing. We're buying. We're tending to spend a little bit more, and maybe buy less wine, but buy higher dollar yeah. bottles. Which I mean, to me. From where I sit in the industry is a great thing because I think, I mean, I do this because I love wine and it probably doesn't shock people to hear, like, I love, like, Barolo. I love the wines I import. I don't love 
you know, I don't go out and buy white Zin and bring it to the party. Not, and I have a lot of respect for like white Zin, um, cheap Lambrusco. The, those are the wines that everyone drinks first. Sure. No one starts out with Barolo. That's it's tannic. It feels like you're, you know, chewing on cotton balls. Like but you the, always those, need those, those wines, wines to, in a, yeah, yeah, in a group too, mm-hmm. where you don't have to think about it. Yeah, exactly. You, know, you get a wine like a, a nice Barolo in your glass. Now you want to pause for a second and let's kind let's of think, analyze what we have yeah. here and appreciate what's in the glass. Exactly. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's hard because I think that those volume, high volume, low dollar categories do support the industry. Um, yeah. they, they employ people. They keep they keep the wheels turning. But yeah, I mean that we're seeing a trade off now where people are buying less but spending more, which better than just buying less. Period. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, I, I think mm-hmm. there's a lot of factors to why people are drinking less. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think there's a a big awareness of you know alcohol consumption and how much should you drink, and then just health overall. I think a lot of the younger generations are. Mm-hmm very much in tune with, you know, trying to maintain and, and be a, a healthier lifestyle more than my generation. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's one thing that I think, I think if wine wants to get serious about courting young consumers, we have to figure, like, we have to figure that out. Because I, you, you do, you look at data on past wine consumption and it's, it's, I drink wine all the time. Like, to me, it is like, it's a daily beverage. Like, if yeah. I'm cooking and I love to cook, I... I want the I want a glass of wine with my meal, and I want the right glass. Like I'm I'm excited about bringing that pairing experience home, um, and I'll have a glass or two, and then yeah. I'll go back to my day, do work. But um, you know, I'm not you're not drinking a bottle a day. And when you think about like when you think about the health effects, I think to me it's important to be honest and be totally open. Like what the day after I tie one on and drink a bunch of wine, I feel awful. Like yeah. and and everyone will tell you that. Like it's I, I, they actually, oh shoot, I wish I should have finished reading this article before we started. They just came out with a new article, um, a, a, a proper scientific study out of Spain. Um, I think managers published a, a write up on it that um, found that wine does play a crucial role in the Mediterranean diet. So, this, this diet that they credit in Spain and France and Italy beyond with yeah. promoting longevity, I kind of had always held like, well, wine's. Wine's a part of it culturally, but doesn't really have any health benefit. This study is saying, no, it really does have a health benefit. I've always been skeptical about those things. I mean, there, there are antioxidants in wine. There are positive things in it. But there's also alcohol. We know alcohol is not good for you. but It's a poison. It's a, it, it is part, it, it can be part of a really balanced, healthy, happy, long sure. life. Um, so, I, yeah, like the, the health question is, I think it's pretty present on millennials' minds and and even and younger consumers. Yeah. I mean, if I go to a party with people my age and younger, um, gosh, people are bringing hard seltzer and light beer and these things that to me just taste like nothing, or at best they taste like nothing. At worst, they taste pretty unappealing. But I, at the I end call of the day, it's, fancy yeah. or fruit flavored water. I yeah, mean, I know yeah. there's a splash of alcohol in there, and and I'm not saying you have to have alcohol to have a good time. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying those those just you know don't yeah. don't do any kind of enhancing of the for me and that's of just the flavor my, yeah yeah no and I honestly I am someone that will say like I drink because I like to think about what I'm drinking and I like the taste and I like how it pairs with food I don't necessarily drink because I love the feeling of getting drunk um, and which 100% like percent agree is and and that's not all the time sometimes it's fun like sometimes it's nice to be a little giggly but like it is and. If that's where things are going, wine is the perfect beverage. Like you, it is the thing that will enhance every piece of food on the table. Will give you something to think about. But it's a big ask to ask a young consumer, especially one with a, not as much discretionary budget as maybe it yeah. was true in the past, um, to open their wallets and try this thing that has to kind of be met on its own terms and thought about and cannot just be tipped back. And written off as like you know a hundred calories per day, and that, that's another you know when you say it, it does you know the investment for you know call it four glasses out of a bottle mm-hmm. uh, is more than you know a twelve pack of beer where you get twelve beers. Yeah. Um, but to that point, a, a, a good wine, and by good I'm you know I'm not saying expensive because mm-hmm. you can get some very good wines around that twenty or sometimes sub twenty dollars, uh, but. A good wine in the glass, you're not going to chug it to your point. You're not going to throw it back. So mm-hmm. the period of time over the course of an evening that you're going to enjoy that glass, talking or visiting with friends, it, it's going to take a little longer for 
you know, you to, so to speak, tie one on. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it, when, when I worked back at the wine school, we also had a, a cellaring facility there. And it was something that, um, that the owner of the school was really big on was saying like, why, wine is an experience. It is something yeah. that you, you open a bottle, you share it between two, three, four, however many people, and you're going to sit there and you're going to hang out until the bottle's done. And over the course of that bottle, there will be conversation. There will be, could be conversation. I mean, in my groups, it's, that's, I mean, it's for me, one big difference when I drink with my wine friends versus my friend friends, my, or my friend friends, my friends that are in wine could, could care less. Well, and my friends oh. that could care less about wine. Yeah. Um, we they will drink a bottle with me just the same, but when I'm drinking with other wine folks, we can talk about the bottle and really get yeah. into it. When I'm drinking with other folks, it's like, no, this is good. And that's it. We leave it there. <laughs> but, <laughs> like, but does that drive what you open for your? No, oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, here. yeah. And there's yeah. And the the thing is, there is overlap. There are wines that I love, and I could you know I could go on and on about that. Any person that doesn't work in wine, doesn't think about wine, thinks of themselves as a beer drinker, they'll say like, oh my gosh, that's delicious, yeah. and they will help me finish that bottle, but um, it's it's a different level. You're not not every drink has to be the cerebral journey. Yeah, but I lo- I love that wine can be. Um, yeah, absolutely, yeah. and that that's why there's different wines. There's different price mm-hmm. points. There's different mm-hmm. you know complexities to wine because you know a less complex wine it might be something you know kind of a single note kind of thing. It's just refreshing and nice to drink out by the pool while you're hanging out with friends. You're not thinking yep. about it, but uh, yeah, for sure. Um, let, let's talk about, you know, on this topic of the, the young wine drinkers, let's, let's get to the other sure. end of that spectrum real quick. Mm-hmm. We have the baby boomers sure, and we have the Gen X mm-hmm. and I don't know what in the industry, the thought is there with them being, you know, purchasers of wine. I'm sure there's a, a portion of those categories that are still buying wines, but I have to think at a, at a certain point when you've grown your collection and you have so many wines in it. At some point, you're going, I'm done buying because, I mean, my years here are not that many left, and mm-hmm. I've got, you know, a 1,000 bottles in my collection. Yeah, it's and it, the, the data, at least in the U.S., is showing that the boomer generation is starting to buy less, okay. um, which it, that's another problem because they, they've they been really good customers, and they, they consistently support brands at all ends of the spectrum. Yep. Entry level stuff, higher end stuff. Um, it's the the good news is it opens up some space for some innovation and some new uh, winemaking styles and products and brands. But um, there is less consumption in that generation. Um, Gen X. I'm trying to. Th- it's funny there. There's almost like a donut in research there because that's my generation. Yeah. It's and I'm trying to think like what I. The, the the sense I get is that Gen X is not the problem. Like they're they're not what pe- folks are focused on because there's been so steady consumption. Steady. Okay. Yeah, there's steady consumption. There's kind of it's the eggs are spread between baskets. There's no one um, category or style that you know stands to gain or lose by cutting into Gen X. There's uh, the millennial Gen Z, Gen Alpha, whatever. That's where folks are really nervous because. They're seeing so far. I mean, higher average per bottle spending, but again, lower overall spending. And the the question is, are we going to get more people to drink wine, or are we going to make less wine? Because for a lot of folks, those are the two options. Um, and I think, I think there are other options out there. Um, for you, to me, all all of those younger generations really value an experience. And we have never lived in a more kind of more mobile time. Um, people are more well traveled now than they've ever been. Where before yeah. you might have this, you know, trip of a lifetime down the Rhine River or you know to Bordeaux or Burgundy. Um, younger generations like to travel, and they they'll do it all the time. And there's that means tons of opportunity for wine tourism, for direct to consumer sales, for things that can bring in things that can that can grow the wine industry beyond just saying. We need the average person to drink an extra gallon of wine a year, you know, because that could happen, but it might not. And that might be a good thing in the end. Yeah. Um, and to, to your point on travel, I mean, mm-hmm. if you travel in the States, wine, when you go to a restaurant, it, it's an option, but it's tucked away. You have to ask for it. Mm-hmm. If you go to Spain or France or Italy, you're drinking wine. Yeah. You're drinking, they're bringing something out that mm-hmm. you're going, hey, you got to have some wine with this, you know. 
Food and wine mm-hmm. go together there. And in another, like another big double-edged sword folks will talk about in the wine world is, is climate change. And I think um, it's it's undoubtedly going to change the styles of wine that are being produced. But there's, especially if you look at the U.S., there are a lot of places now that you couldn't used to make wine um, that now are like uh, northern Michigan has a yeah. whole, a, a great industry. But two of my good friends who work in the industry came from uh, Michigan and they're huge uh, boosters of, of the wine scene there. They're making great wine there. And it's gorgeous. You're up by the Great Lakes. Like you, it is like, to me, if I'm not going to Napa, Oregon, you know, if I'm not going to either of the coasts, I want to go there. And it's, okay. I would like, I would never have thought I would say that like 10, 15 years ago that Michigan's got a vibrant wine scene. Um, high elevation, like Southwestern, like New Mexico, Arizona, they're, yeah. they're cultivating wine tourism in a way that uh, is, is honestly, I think impressive and interesting and, and drawing more people in and, the You're thing, in our backyard. Yeah, in Texas. Yeah, Fr- Fredericksburg, the High Plains. Even here in Houston, we have we have Hock Madeira, and that yeah. is one of the best dessert wines made in this country, I think. And it's made from Blanc de Bois, the little hybrid grape that could from Texas. Yeah. And it's something that folks – I mean, really one thing that Europe's always had that we've never had is this local pride in wine saying like – Oh, the you know we're I'm from Burgundy or I'm from Dijon or I'm from Paris, so I drink champagne and wines from Loire, and these are the best wines, and I love them because they're the wines of my hometown. We have never had that, but um, the East Coast too, wines from Virginia, from Pennsylvania, from upstate New York, like all of these all of these areas that did not used to make any wine worth tasting, selling are are starting to pop up, and I think down the line that really could cultivate a new wave of of drinkers that think of wine as this daily beverage not this not this esoteric thing and and i mean you see this play out with beer um it's beer's a little easier because you don't have quite i quite as much of a terroir focus i think it's fair to say that um yeah i do too and it it's meant that you can that you can open up a brewery almost anywhere and make really good beer and we've seen that like huge explosion of breweries microbreweries in houston and beyond and People love to go to their local brewery and say, I'm drinking a beer that was made right here. And yeah. the closer wine gets to being able to do that, I think it it, it can't not help sales. And and I'll give local breweries another little nod. They, mm-hmm. they do a really good job of, when we talk about experience, it's not just a little bar that you go sit at and have their beer. This mm-hmm. is an... It's, you know, especially on the weekends and things, it's it's a bit of an event. You know, think yeah. about St. Arnold mm-hmm. and things. You're coming, you got cornhole going on, you got bands playing, you got some food trucks rolling in. They make it really cool and fun. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And it's it's the kind of thing that it already exists in California. It'd be a different conversation if we were talking out there, but it's it's going to come to Texas. It's going to come to, yeah. yeah. If, it, if it's coming to Texas and Michigan and the East Coast, it's covering, we're covering a lot of ground. Yeah. And I think it that kind of thing yeah it's it's an experience it's an event it's going to help and it's going to tie tie wine to the kind of experience young folks are out looking for yeah absolutely here here's a question you made mm-hmm. me think about you know when we talk about consuming wine and and let me say it this way when I, when i was growing up i always thought wine was something I, I, mm-hmm. you had to be older to drink one mm-hmm. you had to be a you know, your palate had to be to a certain spot. When you're a younger person, mm-hmm. you can't appreciate it. You're not gonna, mm-hmm. you're not gonna know it. All. Whatever it might be, it just seemed out of reach until you hit a certain age, and then you could start dabbling with wine. It also was very intimidating. You know, to your point, you yeah. made early on about going to a restaurant. You might want wine, but you might be too intimidated to even have the conversation because you don't want to look like a dummy. You don't want to look like a fool. Like you don't mm-hmm. know what you're. You know, if the sommelier mentions something to you, uh-huh. I think a lot of people have gotten over that or should get over that because sommeliers love helping somebody who doesn't know a lot about wine. Yeah, because it's a way for them to get them to experience what could be a great thing. If you know a lot mm-hmm. about wine, it makes their job easy. You just you order what you want and they go get it for you. They yeah. love that conversation of diving into what you might enjoy based on what you're eating or what you've mm-hmm. had in your life and things like that to steer you down the right path. So I'm kind of getting to the question mm-hmm. of younger people. You know, when I think about Europe, they're exposed to wine. They start dabbling in wine kind of like you at 13, 14, 15. Mm-hmm. It's in the house all the time. Probably yeah. at least two meals a day they're having wine. Sure. Is there an age in the States where where we look at our market that there's an 
target age, kind of called a window, 21 mm-hmm. to 25, where we try to get them entering into wine? Is it 25 to 30? I mean, what is the average age? Because for me, it was mid-30s before I even started yeah. getting into wine. And we're, we are seeing that with millennials, especially those that are like the now now aging into a a bracket where they have a lot more disposable income. A lot of it just has just happened, um, has, has really traced, traced age group less than income. And that's, okay. that is one thing. And I think one thing that it, it would serve the wine industry to kind of think about is that, um, when you, when someone comes into a restaurant and looks at the menu without, without exception, really the most expensive thing on the drink menu is going to be a bottle of wine. Yeah. Um, Maybe you know, maybe it's it's a whiskey focused place. Whiskey might push wine out here or there, but without like more often than not, it's going to be a bottle of wine. And even the places that have really low, really competitive markups are great deals. Um, the cheapest bottle of wine will probably land you know thirty to fifty bucks. And someone that drinks cocktails or beer isn't going to see like they they don't make the leap. They don't think. Oh, that's actually a much better deal than ordering three fifteen dollar cocktails. Yeah, um, they just don't like my <laughs> my my roommates like that. He's such a he's a smart guy. He likes wine. He likes cocktails. He'll drink whatever. He goes in and is like, I want to go in for a bottle of wine, and then ends up spending more than he would have anyway. Yeah, um, and it is there is and, something. And I'll just yeah. say this mm-hmm. as well, just because people who've listened to the show know mm-hmm. I feel this way. Uh, cocktails are fine wine. Mm-hmm. Looking over the wine menu. Whiskeys are fine while I'm looking over the wine menu. Mm-hmm. Drink wine with food. <laughs> yeah, no, drink to me that it, like drink wine with food, and yeah. I think to me part of it, yeah. So part part of it's just disposable income. Like yeah. as as any generation ages, you're going to get you're going to get to more and more of a place where you're like, oh yeah, like I can buy that bottle of wine and not stress about it and feel you know feel like I'm being financially responsible. That's a big part of it. Um, there is also, yeah, there's there's the intimidation factor. And I think one thing that I would love to see kind of reverse itself is I, I would like to see a swing back to really eclectic, interesting, user-friendly by the glass lists. Oh, yeah. And it's something that, like, wine bars do really well. It's something that my all my favorite places to drink wine do, do really well. It's not a zero-sum game. You don't have to load up on high-end bottles at the expense of your buy the glass list your buy the glass list is your hook uh, yep. no no one that doesn't already know and love wine feels that comfortable ordering a whole bottle you should be able to say oh you're having this try a glass of the chablis you know you're yeah. getting oysters you're getting oh you're getting the swordfish like maybe actually a pinot i know it's red wine and fish but you're going to really enjoy it and those are, to me that's what hooked me i didn't really believe in wine before i could really see how it shined with food and I wasn't going to order a whole bottle. So having a buy the glass list that's interesting, fun, and user friendly. Um, actually, I'm going tonight uh, to one of my favorite places to drink wine in Houston. And give them her, a shout out. Like, uh, Giacomo is there. There, it's an incredible Italian and French focused wine list. And she, Lynette Hawkins, is the she's the everything. She's the owner, the chef, the sommelier. But um, she writes whole blurbs under each wine list, and it is. I, like the the list comes out in like a it's like a three ring binder basically. It is not sexy. It's not like it's not something that a um, visual like graphic designer would look at and, and approve of in yeah. any sense. But it's something you can flip through and say, oh, I'm ha- I'm having this. Actually, I think I'll have that. And if you don't know, all of the servers they they have a quick recommendation for you. And it's the exact it, it's the kind of thing that will steer people towards wine. Um, I think that helps because it, it does it lets people start gathering data points and that's that's what you need when you're first drinking is a data point. Okay, maybe I like Pinot, maybe I like Zinfandel. Yeah, so so it's it's just what's the age? What's the and, and I would oh, kind of go to yeah. this too. What what's the strategy in the wine world? You know, for mm-hmm. for importers and distributors and and establishments that are trying to you know get po- folks younger folks to drink wine. Um, because you know, look, I'll tell you that I, I'm a sure. bit of a traditionalist. You know, I, I uh, will I drink organic wine? Mm-hmm. Yes. You yeah. know, does it sell me? Do I look at it and go, okay, it's organic. I got to have mm-hmm. it. It's natural. Do I have to have it? You know, I'll be honest. Natural probably is more of an off than yeah, it is than an on, on for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, those are fine things, and I'm all for you know making sure we do things. You know, as farmers, the right way. Yep. But 
are these things that we're just highlighting because we want to give them some recognition that they're, they're doing things the right way? Or is this something in the wine world that they're trying to do because they know these younger generations are more aware of organic, natural, these kind of things? They're both. Both, um, okay. We're doing them, like, we're doing it because it's the right thing. Um, and that's, I mean, full stop, wine is going to be impacted by climate change way, way more immediately and with, with more of a, with broader sweeping consequences than mm -hmm. beer or whiskey um, or any other liquor because there's such a, there's just such an easily detected impact on the grape and its ripeness. And, um, and you get a great point. It's a double-edged sword. Some places yeah. are going to be impacted negatively, and some places are going to be impacted a little bit more positively. No, absolutely. I mean, and even I, I did my I, I did my research project for the diploma program on climate change and wine, and we're actually we're still in the era where pretty much everyone is making better wine. Yeah, from climate change. Some some areas are making different wines. Some areas, five vintages, four four vintages out of five, they make better wines. And then I mean. Now we're starting to turn the corner in places like Australia and California because of wildfire. There's nothing good you can say about a wildfire. Yeah. I mean, thing, catastrophic fire events are just going to cause massive pain and suffering and displacement. And having a bad vintage wine is going to be the least of our problems. But in general, right now, climate change, like we're making better wine for it. Eventually, there are going to be huge consequences to the wine industry and the world eventually. Like the world brought more broadly, it we're going to have to figure out a way to solve it and organics and sustainable farming are a big part of it. Um, I think a lot of, and, and it is a part of wine marketing. I think for me, I'm a believer. There have been some studies that people care about organic, sustainable, natural people, people care more about price and that's still and how quality. it is. We're price and quality, to quality. Price, yeah. price to quality. People still would rather see a wine that's in their budget and has a, a, Tastes a good, good repu <laughs> a rep yeah, a good rating from a reputable critic, or that they've tasted before and they know they're going to like it, than see organic or sustainable. The thing with wine is, gra grape vines are easy to farm. They're weeds. They're yeah. the farming plays a role. The l by far the largest carbon impact from wine comes from the shipping of it, and by far the biggest thing that weighs on the impact of shipping is the weight, and that comes from glass. And wine is traditional, and it's going to take a lot to get us to move past glass. I mean, I think there is so one one interesting thing about sustainability organics and marketing is like we we have built a pr I think a pretty good eco-friendly image for wine. We've also built this great image of this wine being the the drink of refinement and the drink of you know, when you go out to eat, you might not have a bottle of wine at home, but you're going to have a bottle of wine at the fancy restaurant. Oh yeah. And we've trained a generation of really sharp, really smart psalms that can go out there and sell that wine pretty well. Problem is we we're all we all want to go sell you that awesome expensive bottle of Burgundy that we love, and it's going to co come in glass, and it's going to be, it's going to look a certain way. And I think if we really if we want to get serious about not like the next five ten years, but the next hundred years, we're going to have to get a little bit more creative and a little bit more humble about how we sell wine and say, look, we need we need talented sommeliers selling cask wine, keg wine. We need talented yeah. sommeliers sourcing really delicious wines that people can drink at home in a boda box or whatever yeah. it might be. And I, it, it's, it's hard for me to say that because I mean, I, it's not what I do. It's, it's, but it's something that I think if we're really serious about the future and sustainability and of enticing younger people to drink wine, like, we, we got to kind of eat some humble pie and start selling these different formats. And I think yeah. it's a great point, not not just to when we talk about the dollars mm -hmm. in wine and what you have to spend for a bottle. Yeah. Because to this point, if you open that bottle, mm -hmm. you, especially a red wine, you really mm -hmm. feel like I got to finish that at least in a day or two. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. White wine, you can go a few days more. But mm -hmm. uh, if you had this kind of vessel carrying the wine, what I've heard in, in reading some of these things, that wine is going to last longer in the fridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it kind of creates this ability to then enjoy that wine over a longer period of time. And the investment for what you're spending, you don't feel like you're obligated when you pop that thing to, to kind of finish it. So Yeah. Why, yeah. No, wine likes to be with wine. Like the, more, the larger storage vessel you have, the more shelf-stable it yeah. is. And, I mean, I've seen, yeah, I mean, just the cost of... Even shipping aside, the co we there are some wines that we import both in keg and in bottle, and 
it's always about, you know, it's, it's 30% cheaper at least to sell it in the keg. And that's not even thinking about shipping and, and how much less of an environmental impact the keg is going to have over the bottle. And when you think about, yeah, like, like my, my point of just bringing people in and selling them on a glass of wine, that's where you bring your keg out. Like we can, we do it for beer. There are beer halls with 80 plus beers on tap. I'm not saying every city needs an 80 wine tap wine hall, but I do think if it's, it's got to start somewhere yeah. and there needs to be, there needs to be restaurants or on-premise account places selling wine like that. There needs to be wineries willing to put their wine in keg and learn about it. Sure. Um, it, it, the whole industry kind of has to get on board because I think we're, we're doing a lot of great things to, to bring in young folks. But um, from a sustainability issue, the elephant in the room is that glass is terrible for the environment or Absolutely. for, for our carbon footprint in shipping. It's, it's recyclable. Again, you have to live in a state that reliably recycles it. You have to do this. You have to do that. There's certain things the Europeans are way ahead of us on, but and one of the yeah. the regions that I'll and, and I want mm-hmm. to talk about this region mm-hmm. uh, on a couple different points, Napa, no, one of yeah. the worst for glass. I mean, heavy bottles, yeah, heavy big bottles, and you know, quite honestly, they don't work well in my wine refrigerator. So that's another reason I don't like them. But mm-hmm. they are too big and heavy. Um, and and I I love the Bordeaux bottle because yeah. wine refrigerators are made for it. You stack and, it, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. and they just work great, and, and it's not as heavy. Um, but touching on Napa. You know, I, mm-hmm. I was listening to somebody speak about wine, and he made this comment uh, that where whatever country you're from, you should try to support the local wine in that mm-hmm. country as much as you can. You mentioned it a little bit about having that, that pride, that sense of pride for yeah. where your wine is. That's from my home state or my yep. home country. Um, and then he made the comment, except America. <laughs> and And he said that because of, cost you know he said you know one cost but Mm -hmm. two america does a really good job of of importing wines from all over the globe that we have access to it he said a lot of places around the 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 globe Mm -hmm. they have their wines they don't have a huge assortment of wines from napa or if you're in italy from france or there's some but not like we have here Mm -hmm. and and i tend to agree with him i i wonder sometimes for the american wine market are are they just going to continue to go up and is this going to you know, is this part of the reason that young people don't want to get into wine? Because I think their first exposure to wine is here mm-hmm. in the States, mm-hmm. and they see those prices. Or are, are they getting educated enough to go look at old world-style wines or new other new world regions that have good value, Chile maybe being one of them or something like that? Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a big question. Um, I think, I, I personally, I don't think price is the biggest issue. Okay. I think a lot of it's a brand image thing. Cause we, we make inexpensive wine in America. The, the problem is when you think about what it, what's actually in the bottle. Um, I will say like we bring in one of our cheapest wines that we sell and distribute is from Lodi and it's so well made. And it's like, I would prefer it over a lot of bottles that are double the price on a hot day for something crisp and easy. And it's a white wine. Um, they make, they make a, we, we set, well, they make a lot of wine, but we sell a, everything from Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc to Pinot and Cab from them. Okay. Um, and they're all, they are all correct. They're all great for what they, for where they are and where they sit in the price point. Um, and they, they sell really well because people don't have this connotation that the major, that they have with major brands. Like at this point, I think even young consumers, the cat's out of the bag that they're not, they're quote unquote, not supposed to like, Barefoot Moscato yeah. or you know White Zin or what, whatever it might be. And Moscato can be great. Oh, that's my, another one of our favorite yeah. wines that we sell. Is the, it's a Moscato d'Asti. It comes from a single vineyard way up in the mountains, oh, yeah. and it's still cheap, but it's it's fantastic and it's complex and it's it's the kind of wine that really can hook people in because all of a sudden they're they've gone from thinking it's the sweet sugar juice to being like, oh my gosh, I taste peaches, I taste white pepper and sage and all all these great notes. But so. I think my point on price with American wine is um, we we actually make some really good cheap wine, um, and we have really interesting places to do it. Um, the issue is that our most successful brands, the ones everyone knows, um, I it's they they're in the point of their product cycle where they could use a refresh. That's at least to me because I can't remember a time when anyone has ever told me like when White Zin has ever been anything but a joke like and. 
it's funny because it's not the worst wine in the world. It's, yeah. it's, it's, and I would say the same for things like Cage, like Kendall Jackson Chardonnay. Oh, um, yeah. It's, and people don't realize yeah. Kendall Jackson, the role they play in the wine globally, you know, what they're doing in Australia and things. Yep. I mean, they make fantastic wines. I, I would say the same thing about Mondavi. Yeah. Uh, no, that's one really eye opening thing I've been grateful for with the MW program is that they, they brought us to a bunch of the Mondavi facilities. We went to Gallo we, and we tasted everything from Woodbridge, the $7 double like Magnum bottle yeah. they make to their single vineyard Tokalon. And at the price point, all of those wines are good for what they are, and I think perform as they should at that price. You can disagree with the idea that any wine should ever cost 300 bucks a bottle like the Tokon Cab probably does, but um, they're good and they're well-made. And I think really, yeah, more than anything, there's an image refresh that I I would like to see um, because – yeah, we, I, yeah. I, I absolutely agree with you. I think mm-hmm. that's the biggest thing, and I hadn't thought about it that way, the image refresh. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I think, you know, for me, you know, I'm just this kind of consumer guy that has this mm-hmm. hobby of really enjoying wine. Uh, and I think in the world we live in today, uh, when we're going to go to social media, mm-hmm. you know, whether it be a wine group in social media mm-hmm. or, you know, just wine content in social media, and people who typically post on social media with wine, yeah. they're not posting that, you know, $12 Sauvignon Blanc that really is a huge bang for your buck. They're always posting something that's this high-end kind of, not, that's where you, you hope you get more clicks, right? Yeah, yeah. And so that's probably a little bit of a disservice to the to the wine industry here because there are, to mm-hmm. your point, there are some great wines out there that you just have to work a little bit to find them because, to your point, they're not marketed as these are what you should be drinking from our portfolio. Exactly. And it is, I, again, it's a double-edged sword. When people yeah. tell me that they're thinking of getting into wine and they want to know where to start, the first thing I tell them is, listen, you're going to think this is too much, but spend $30 on the bottle. Yeah. Don't spend less. Because that really, like, you, you get to see, the, the longer you do this and more wine you taste, there are these kinds of tiers of, like, really, what can a winemaker do with X budget and X bottle that or X dollar amount that they're going to eventually charge? Yeah. And to me, right around 30 bucks is where you're like, that's that's really, really exciting. There's so much stuff that's cheaper than that that is still really great. Um, but I, like, I do, I push people to, if they're really trying to die, deep dive, just spend a little bit more than you think you'll need to. And it's... You, It'll be rewarding, but yeah, that being said, like the big inexpensive brands are making better wine than they've ever made before. And if you look a little bit past them and find other wines that are still, you know, they're not the wines that sommeliers go home and drink, but at $20, $15 a bottle, they, they pack a lot of value and really are delicious yeah. to drink. Um, you'll find all sorts of things that you just haven't heard of. And uh, some of them are coming from Chile, some of them from Australia, wherever it may be. But they are they do exist in the states. It's just that. Well, and, and the other thing I would say is them, yeah. get away from Napa. I mean, not not yeah. get away totally, but don't think that that's the only place you can get good wine, even mm-hmm. on the West Coast. Uh, because I would say you know Oregon does some fantastic stuff, Washington State, mm-hmm. but also going into Sonoma and going down to Santa Barbara and going down to Paso. I mean, explore. Yeah. I always say keep exploring when you get into wine. Expl- and yeah, it's a it's a fact that once you're in Napa County, and definitely once you're in the Napa AVA, your your price for fruit doubles, quadruples yep. compared on de- depending on where you were sourcing before that. So if you want Napa on the label, you're going to pay more. That's that's it. But yeah. like a, the I mean, a twenty dollar bottle of Riesling from Finger Lakes in New York is going to be delicious, and it's going to pair well with seafood it's going to pair well with poultry it has the acid to stand up to pork and the body to stand up to some other red meat like it's it can do a lot um yeah same thing with just a general willamette valley chardonnay or pinot prices are still climbing there too but you can yeah you can go to oregon you can go to certainly washington other parts of california and you'll you'll find the value um you you just have to be willing to dig because also i mean there's something to be there there are economies of scale with these big, big California brands too. Like a lot of the good fruit in the state, Mondavi's buying it or, yeah. you know, Gallup, whoever it might be, they're buying it and they're actually, they're using it to make their big brand wines better. So, I mean, on, on one hand, I push people spend more, do a little research. You'll, you'll be happy you did. On the other hand, this is the best time in the, this is the best time in history. I would argue to drink wine. And I think a lot of folks, in the industry would say the same like 
wine is an art, but it's it's a craft too. And we've never had a better understanding of the technology of the farming practices that go into making really great wine. Yeah. Um, so you're 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 seeing across the world. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and to be fair to the to the West Coast, mm-hmm. uh, they're not just higher priced because they want to be higher priced. I yeah. mean they they have to your point uh, land taxes and cost and, and mm-hmm. a lot more different regulations and mm-hmm. things that, you know, other places around the world, other places around the country may not have. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's just a cost of doing business. They have to do it that way. Yeah. They, I, I mean, yeah, they have to do it that way. And that is your, if you are, if you want a prediction for like the next 10, 50 years, like a lot of those places, they're going to see their star rise and and fall, and that's okay. They're going to find a, a niche in the industry that might not yeah. be. Napa is where everything started here. It's where all of these, you know, Judgment of Paris wines came from. It's yep. what put the country on the map. Um, the best, the first best wines in Italy were made in the Roman times, and they were made in Calabria. And yep. no one really lives there anymore. There's not a, like they t- they had their time. It will in the in the long long view. It will come and go, and that's okay. You're still going to be making great wine, and yeah, um, you know i I will drink Napa for almost whenever it's offered to me because there's there's a lot to like there. It's, oh, it's, absolutely, yeah. Um, they make some fantastic wines, um, mm-hmm. but yeah. I'm, my point yeah. with you know, I, I'm kind of give them a hard time about being expensive, not mm-hmm. because I don't think they make good wines. There's a reason that they they are a little pricey, and, mm-hmm. I, and I get it. Mm-hmm. But when you start looking at your budget and you're a younger person, and you go, you know, a lot of times your first trip might be to California to Napa. A lot of times yep. it is, and you go, man, really good. I just mm-hmm. can't afford it. My point would be, don't stop there. Yeah, you know, look around the country, look around the globe, because. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there's great wines that can be a little bit more financially mm-hmm. attainable for you to enjoy. There, there's wines all over the place. So don't stop drinking just because of cost. Yeah, and, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And don't, I, this is another thing that I'm, I'm so glad that I have been on my side of the industry to like the thing that I think a lot of folks are also shy to kind of walk into a restaurant or a wine shop and say their budget. And that's one thing that's like, a great point. If I could tell my gener like my generation and younger folks anything about like how to help you enjoy wine better, be just be super straightforward. Come in and tell if you've ha- or had a wine you like, tell the person working the floor or you know in the retail shop like this is what I've enjoyed in the past and this is exa- this is what I want to spend. What would you recommend? Because a lot of folks I think are shy to do that and come off as like cheap or stingy. But like if I when I'm working table side or with a customer that's like the first the first thing i want to know because you can come in and say i'd like a chardonnay and i can send you with something that costs ten dollars or ten thousand tell me what price point we're in and tell me what you've enjoyed before do you like a bigger full-bodied oakier thing do you want lean racy acidity are we looking in village level chablis or are we looking in corton charlemagne or you know like single vineyard napa do you want yara valley like say all give all the information you can and that includes your price point to to the person helping you out, and you're going to have a better experience. And the other thing I would just add to that is, if it's on their wine list, it's probably a good wine, even if it's mm-hmm. not $1,000 a bottle and it's $35 a bottle. Yep. They put it on there because they feel like in their establishment, it's a good enough wine to be on our list. That's that's such a good point. And one thing I don't think I, I talk enough about, about restaurants is like, you don't, you know, yeah, like when you go into a restaurant, you're not like, a lot of these places have a, they have a curated food menu yeah. and the wine list is just as curated all of these things someone has chosen and already tasted you're in good hands there's not going to be total dogs yeah. Th- there will totally be something if you like smooth silky wines maybe you don't pick the Sagrantino or the Nebbiolo yeah. or whatever um, but that's just you know that's something you can ask your server and they should be able to help you um, and you, if not it's something that you you kind of make a note of for yourself. And there's nothing wrong with saying, well, the last five Pinots I've tried I liked, so I'm going to order a Pinot again. Because yeah. Pinot's a rabbit hole. You you will, oh. you will can find plenty of diversity there. And, Absolutely. You know, without yeah. going too far off track. Like, it's... Don't be shy about saying what you want and what you're looking for, but then you'll find your comfort zone, and that's fine if you want to stay there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So as we wrap this episode mm-hmm. up... What would you say are some things that, you know, 
you're excited about that you think the industry is doing well uh, in getting these younger drinkers into wine and appreciating wine? And what are a couple things you'd like to see improved on? Are there some things that you you know you still think the wine industry do, needs to do better? I think they they've done a pretty good job of trying to make it uh, not so snobby. I'll say it that mm-hmm. way. You know, more yeah. engaging for folks to come and enjoy wine. Yeah, more engaging and not so snobby. And I think being able to share the spotlight a little bit. Like if I if I want to get my friends that don't drink a lot of wine to come drink wine with me, be there's got to be another activity. And I think beer, beer at concerts, like drinking cocktails at the, at the jazz bar, like they, they, they've figured that out a little bit. And it's something that we should be open to about with wine. Um, Wine dinner, wine dinners are a big one. And I think the more I I talk to a lot of other folks on my side of the industry that work with restaurants and um, wine dinners are actually often kind of neglected like i there's a lot of i don't want to you know name names or talk like talk about wine dinners i that i can remember that have flopped but a lot of them that i've been involved with just we didn't put the time and thought into them that we should have and when you're thinking about like what's the event that you can tie into wine eating is like that's that should be the easiest thing is to can can i give you a thought Mm -hmm. on wine dinners yeah so we enjoy wine dinners, and I'm going to tie this back mm-hmm. into price mm-hmm. because a lot of wine dinners, uh, they're, they're built around, the, and I think this is another misconception of wine. Yeah. If you're going to drink a nice bottle of wine, you have to have this nice meal to go with it. Mm-hmm. And wine dinners are typically built around, look at this five-course meal, and look at this yep. wine you're going to have. I would love to see a, a wine dinner, and I would absolutely attend if it were this you know, call it the the football foods with wine. You know, you have these kind of appetizers mm-hmm. mixed in with the smash burger and some kind of a, you know, a, a fun dessert, whether it be a cake or a mm-hmm. pie or a pudding that you pair with a dessert wine. You know, something that you just go, okay, the big expense here isn't the food. It's, it's the more, one, yeah. and it also opens people up to go, you know, if you're going to open a nice burgundy, you don't have to cook you know, beef bourguignon to have it with. Mm-hmm. You, you can have it with whatever you want. Yeah, that's bringing, yeah, kind of modu- like a- adjusting the tone yeah. of these dinners could go, I think to me, could go a long way and and help even also bring the price down because you, no restaurant wants to spend all this time putting together a wine dinner that they're only going to run once and they're not going to make a lot of yeah. margin off of. That's not sustainable, but it's also not sustainable when, I mean, when you think about it and, Five course meal, that's not cheap. That's over you're at a hundred at least yeah. that you're spending. And then you add in a nice bottle of wine, nice bottle of wine at a restaurant, that's another hundred. And you say people you tell people, all right, this is a two hundred, two hundred fifty dollar ticket and you're just gonna have to trust us here, you're only gonna get people that already love wine. Yeah. You it there is some middle ground to be found between how we're doing things now and something that's a lot more approachable and fun and will just draw people in. So I yeah. More events, more dinners around wine, more more things that will will give you an excuse to drink the wine. It's not you don't have to already be interested in wine. Um, I would love to see more of that. <sighs> I'm trying to think what I, I and I would love to see more interesting creative formats of wine because at the end of the day, um, liquor keeps forever once you open it. Yeah. Like you know maybe vermouth you have to put in the fridge, but. Li- I don't worry about opening a bottle of whiskey because it's going to be there when I need it. Five years from now, it's fine. Beer, I don't worry about opening a bottle of beer because I'm going to drink it all yeah. right now. Oh, it's 12 ounces. What's good? Yeah. Wine, wine is in this weird middle ground, and we've just we've kind of agreed on the 750 milliliter as the standard size of wine. Great. It's perfect if you have someone to share with, but it does it, it requires consensus in a way that I think is great and builds community, but... It would be really nice to have some better wines. Not that the current bag and box selection isn't great, but we we need to offer some better selections in different sizes. Yeah. Um, and it's it's again it's an elephant in the room because it will take a lot to redo the supply chain just for getting these different sized bottles or whatever it may be. But we will need. To, I think I think it would serve us well to do that just to draw in more folks. I think you make a great mm-hmm. point because I would like you know I think. And tell me if I'm wrong, mm-hmm. but 10, 15 years ago, you would see more bigger format bottles. Um, mm-hmm. And and I think because we're trying to be more aware of glass and 
the environment, rightfully so. But mm-hmm. to have something, because, you know, I'm going to have a dinner with eight people on Saturday, mm-hmm. and I'd like to have a, a big format bottle of something. And it's sure just hard one, yeah. to find. Yeah, it, it's hard to find. It's hard to find big formats. It's hard to find small formats. It's hard to find anything but so this one you. very standard size, yeah. which hurts when your standard size is not a single serving. Like beer, it's no not a big deal that you can buy, that it comes in a single serve can, because you can buy 10 cans if you want. That's right. But but you don't have that luxury with wine, and I mean even we we've tried canned wine. Can is cans are hard for the same reason. There's a perception problem where a 12 ounce can of wine is half a bottle. So a good to get a good wine and put it in a can, you're still looking at like 13 bottles for a 12 ounce can. People see that they compare yeah. 13 dollars for this can to a four dollar can of beer, and it's it's hard to get them to, to come over to that. Um, so, I mean, it's it's not going to be easy. It's going to take a lot of kind of creative yeah. thinking about, like, how we drink and what, what formats and, and when we And us consumers drink. to yeah. ask for it. Yeah. You know, if we continue to ask, the mm-hmm. industry is going to give the consumer basically what they want. So, I think, mm-hmm. you know, those listening who are consumers who would like to see some of this stuff, start asking for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, one note I'll let on the, the can subject, my one of my favorite chocolatey producers, and ch- chocolate is the, that's the ultimate unfussy wine. It's, yeah. That I, we, I used to sell it as adult lemonade. Like, it is just so refreshing and so easy. And finally, they have started moving to these, I think they're like six, eight ounce cans. Um, they're slim. They come in a nice, cute little four pack. And yeah. it's not, it's not going to solve things overnight. But um, I know people that take them when they go float the river here. And that is great to me. It's like, yeah. I never would have thought people would be drinking wine on a river before. I um, love that idea. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I do just want to say, I, mm-hmm. I love your idea of better or different or more inclusive events for the consumer. Cause I know a lot of times you and I might go to mm-hmm. a tasting, uh, that's put on by whatever group that's putting it on. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have seen, I think, and you tell me if I'm wrong, Walden, mm-hmm. uh, They'll have these events for those in the industry during the day. Mm-hmm. Then they come back and have a different or a newer, not newer, a, a, a might be a dinner or might be something tied in for, for the consumer. Yep. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think great. those are great. Me too. Me too. They're great. And they give it, they give the folks on our side of the business a chance to get feet on the ground and talk to people in a way that they don't. You, you in, in a way that breweries can do because I have five breweries within a few blocks of my house. Yeah, I don't have a single winery because wine has to be made in a certain place. But when when the when folks travel and that is one thing, it's already built into our industry and the and our marketing budgets to have in wine someone that's going to travel the country and see accounts, see consumers, make that connection. And Absolutely. Yeah, I I'm not a big social media person at all, but like let them follow your Instagram because like you're. The pictures you post of your winery are probably prettier than the pictures that you're going to see coming from the rum factory or the <laughs> you know the Milwaukee brewery. It's just how not even probably they will be. they will be yeah. yeah like it's it is one thing that we definitely have that we could capitalize more on. I think. Yeah yeah. Well, Walden, this has been a lot of fun, man. I, I enjoyed you coming on and kind of having this fun conversation, just talking about the world mm-hmm. of wine right now and mm-hmm. the young consumers in wine and. Uh, I've learned a lot. I, I, I've definitely gained some knowledge on kind of what the industry from you uh, on the inside are looking at doing to uh, kind of change kind of how we look at wine and how we consume wine and the availability of wine. I really appreciate that. Thank you. No, thank you for having me. Um, this was super fun. And um, yeah, I mean, I I hope some folks my age and younger drink listen to this and say, I'm going to go out and buy, I don't care if it's a bottle of wine or a can of chocolate, go buy it. Absolutely. And, <laughs> and hopefully in the future, you and I'll have some opportunity to Do a few more of these. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Food, Wine, and Whiskey. And until our next episode, enjoy your next pour. Something good, I hope.